Amos 6, 1 to 8, however, is where we are. 6, 1 to 8. <clears throat> Let me read, I'll pray, and then we'll dive in. Amos 6, <clears throat> verse 1. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. The notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Kalna and see, <clears throat> from there go to Hamath the Great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Is their territory greater than your territory? O oh, you who put away the day of disaster, remember them in our last small group who say, well, judgment will not overtake us, and who bring near the seat of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock <clears throat> and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David, invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls, who anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they shall now be the first of those who go into exile. And the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. For the Lord is sworn by himself, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. I abhor the pride of Jacob. I hate his strongholds. And I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. Father, as we come <clears throat> one last time to this great book, this somber book, but also this hopeful book, I pray that you will help us listen for your word and help us respond to its call. Thank you that we do not have that famine of the word of God. Help us not to push your word away. For your name's sake. Amen. I won't give you the title of my sermon just at the moment, <clears throat> but I hope it will become clear as we go. In Matthew chapter 19 <clears throat> and verse 30, you don't have to turn there. I'll tell you what's there. In Matthew 19 and verse 30, Jesus concludes a block of teaching about who will enter the kingdom of God. And he ends that block of teaching with these famous words, that in God's economy, many who are first will be last. And those who are lost will be first. I must admit, I've always found that statement from Jesus deeply unsettling. It's one that turns the world's way of thinking completely upside down, right? For it makes crystal clear that when it comes to entry into the kingdom of God, then neither wealth, nor power, nor social status, nor religious pedigree, nor privilege count for anything at all. When it comes to the kingdom of God and entry into his kingdom, well, neither wealth, nor power, nor social status, nor religious privilege, nor religious pedigree, none of those things count for anything at all. 
Now, that is a hard truth to believe, right? Our world goes against that truth because in our world, the first will be first. The 1% will be first. If you have enough privilege, enough status, enough money, you can pretty much go anywhere. Imagine some celebrity, some wealthy person arriving uninvited at some big event in the city. Do you think they're going to be turned away at the door? Bill Gates arriving, some great pop star, some great footballer. I'll just mention Mohamed Salah because of last night's scoreline for Liverpool. 5-1. I know the blue team's coming, but nevertheless... No, no, you can't imagine Jürgen Klopp being turned away at the door. We'll make space for him, we say. We'll let him in. We'll find a way. No, no, in our world, the first will be first. But as far as the kingdom of God is concerned, well, those things count for nothing. It's a hard thing to believe, right? Or is that just me? But I want to tell you it's an even harder thing to preach. It's a hard thing to preach, especially in the hearing of those who in the world's eyes and in their own estimation are among the first. Now, in Amos chapter 6, verse 1 to 8, our text for today, the focus is actually not on entry and inclusion. Where is the focus? It's on exile and exclusion, on judgment rather than on salvation. But I want to tell you that Amos' message is no less unsettling than the message of Jesus, and perhaps it's even harder to preach. I wonder if you can see it. Look with me. Who is this word addressed to? Well, it's a word spoken about the notable people, the leading men of the first of the nations. It's about those in Israel to whom the rest of the people looked with envy and with admiration. It's about the religious elite, the wealthy of the land, the first, the notable men, right? It's about those of whom they themselves and perhaps many others in Israel would have said, surely they are blessed. But God's word to them is the very opposite of blessing, is it not? God's word to them, verse 1, is woe. God's word to them, verse 4, is woe. Woe to the wealthy. Those... Woe to those who buy luxury beds and cars and houses and furniture. Woe. And woe is an ominous word because it is associated with judgment. But supremely, this unsettling word is there in verse 7. Look with me at verse 7. For Jesus and entry into the kingdom, well, the last will be first and the first will be last. But when it comes to judgment, do you see it? The first will be first. That's my sermon title. The first will be first. When it comes to judgment and to exile, the privileged of the world, religious, financial, economic, political, whoever they are, those who say disaster will not overtake us, our passage for our small group, those who put away the day of disaster, verse 3, no, no, you will be first in line. You may be first in the world, but when it comes to the word of woe and to exile and to judgment, you'll be first 
in line. Try preaching that. And yet preach it, we must. Even if we are told, hey brother, go preach that message somewhere else. <laughs> now the exile of verse 7, of course, in the first instance, is the historical deportation which befell Israel in the north in 722 and eventually found its way down to its southern neighbor Judah in 597. So historically, what Amos said was literally, literally true. It was the nobles and the bright ones and the young ones and the kings and the rulers who were first off into exile, right? We know this from the history books of the Old Testament. But understand, and here our biblical theological themes help us, that this idea of exclusion from God's place, exclusion from God's presence, this idea of exile is not, in theological terms, a new idea. It began where? Well, in the garden, where the first human beings, who had all the privilege in the world, took their privilege and turned it into autonomy from the Word of God. And they were driven out. Jesus himself uses the language of exile and speaks of an eternal exile. Jesus speaks about a place where the fire is not quenched, where the worm does not die. Where does he get that language from? Well, he gets it from the great book of exile, from the prophet Isaiah. How does the prophet end his book? For though there will be a new heaven and a new earth, a kingdom in which the first, well, the last will be first, at the end of the book of Isaiah, the terrible reality of an eternal exile is described in these terms. They shall go out and look on the dead bodies of men who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, and the fire shall not be quenched. In the book of Isaiah, he's talking about the exile to Babylon, right? But by the time Jesus picks up that language, he is using it to talk about the eternal exile, hell itself. And here then, is the theological import of Amos's words, shocking words. The first in this world who put away the day of judgment, who will not listen to the word of God, will be the first into hell. That's some message, right? No wonder the powerful and the rich and the wealthy said to Amos, go preach that somewhere else. You try preaching that amongst the political elite of Kenya. Brother, go preach somewhere else. You try preaching that amongst the proud and the wealthy and the powerful of the land. Brother, go preach somewhere else. Or at least... Don't speak that word. Talk about getting into heaven. Even tell us that the last will be first and the first will be last into heaven. But whatever you do, don't tell us that the 1%, the first, will be first into hell. Don't preach that. Speaking truth to power and privilege is never an easy thing, right? It seldom ends well for those who speak. The history of the church will tell you that. The fires of the martyrs will tell you that. Amaziah's and Jeroboam's response to Amos makes that quite clear. We looked at that in our small group. As indeed does Stephen's ill-fated sermon and speech in Acts 7. That didn't end too well for him from a this-worldly point of view. No, no. 
The whole Bible and the whole of church history tells us that those who speak God's truth to power and privilege will be opposed. Jesus spoke about being persecuted for righteousness. But speak we must. We cannot let fear silence us. But here is something very important. We must be careful that what we speak to power and privilege is what God actually says. Not out of our bias or our prejudice or our resentment. And here, brothers, let me tell you, Amos 6, 1 to 8 has surprised me. And here, these words taken in context are both surprising and helpful. Look again at verses six, chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. Look again at what Amos actually condemns. Will you do that? Does he condemn money per se? Does he condemn privilege per se? Does he condemn status per se? No. What does he condemn? 6 1. To the first of men who are at ease. Not privilege, but presumption is what he actually condemns. Self-confidence, that comes with privilege, right? Verse 2, verse 3, he condemns that mistaken belief <clears throat> that when God comes to deal with people, those who are privileged will be the exception to the rule, that they'll get special privileges. Are you any different from these kingdoms? What's the answer? Not at all. You're just the same as everybody else. Your money, your power, your privilege doesn't. There's no exceptions. God doesn't show favorites. It's not privilege per se. It's the problem of thinking that because I'm privileged, I should be treated as special. Yeah? It's not privilege and power per se. It's the abuse of privilege and power. For those, verse 3, who... Put away the day of disaster, but bring near the day of violence. Ken told us that having power is fine, provided we use our power, our privilege, for godly ends, right? See, we can turn this, the first will be first into hell, we can turn it into a socio-political statement. That just because you're privileged, just because you're wealthy, just because you're educated, just because of this, God is against you. Rubbish. But if you let your privilege lead you to presumption, self-confidence, abuse of power, well then, brother, you're in real trouble. It's not power and privilege, but Verse 4 to verse 6, the self-indulgent life, the lying around on beds of ivory. I went, when I was last year, to the burning site of the ivory in the park. Who lie around with their high-fidelity systems that cost more than most people earn in a lifetime. Their latest phone, their Top of the range technology, listening to the music and writing little songs for themselves on their video clips. But they have no sense of grief over the suffering of people. And verse 6, the ruin of Joseph. People who, for all their wealth and power and privilege, have no heart for the lost. And by the way, pastor, Don't duck this word too soon, will you? For you can sit in your ivory tower of theological power and privilege and not care for the lostness of the people around you. 
the ruin of Nairobi. Not just its political and financial burdens, but the lostness of its people. The lostness of the people of Cape Town. Oh, I can preach fine-sounding sermons, but not have a heart for the lost outside the door of my church. Ultimately, and throughout the book, it is a refusal, is it not, to listen to the Word of God. We've seen that throughout this book. They will not listen. They will not repent. They will not turn. And therefore they will be judged. Not because of privilege. I think verse 8 sums it up, right? What is the real problem? What is the real thing that Amos is against? What lies at the heart of all of Israel's sin in its many manifestations, its injustice, its immorality? Well, it's the ancient sin, isn't it? It is the trap of the devil. It is the first sin. It is the great transgression. It has one name in verse 8. Can you see it? What is its name? Pride. For Amos, for Jesus, the proud the self-righteous, the self-sufficient, the self-confident, the self-reliant. Do you know that Jesus only once uses the word self in front of a word? And do you know what that word is? Denial. Self-denial. But for all those who choose not to deny self, but to put self first, who trust in themselves, who hope in themselves. For the proud, the first will be first. And hell is waiting. And so last night, as I was thinking this through and pointing my finger in my mind, listening to the State of the Nation address in the United States, pointing my finger in my mind, thinking about my own country, pointing my finger in my mind in our election year, yeah, yeah. First will be first. Well, it's the old school trick, isn't it? <laughs> As I pointed my finger, I was reminded that as a son of Adam, I'm not beyond this. As a white South African, I am among the first in terms of privilege and power, position and wealth. As a pastor, Privilege, power, position. When Alison and I joined the team at St. James, it's a cultural thing. It may be true here, it may not be true here. But somebody from the Malay area of our city came to Alison and said, what does it feel like to be the first lady of St. James? Is that language used in churches here of the pastor's wife? Well, if she's the first lady, what am I? And so as I pointed down there, I found the finger back at me, rebuking my pride, rebuking my self-indulgence, rebuking my presumption, rebuking my tolerance, saying, oh, judgment will not fall on me. I can do this. I can do that. I'll escape. I've got privilege.
And I remembered something about the roar of the lion. And I remembered that the roar of the lion is in the first place a warning. And I remember that Jesus began his preaching about this kingdom with a word, repent. And brothers, I was so thankful, even as I heard this word of woe, that for me at least, that will not be the last word. Though undoubtedly I deserve it. I'm so thankful that even in this terrible warning about hell, there is a window of opportunity to flee to the line of Judah, to the Lamb who was slain, and to become lost, even though I'm first. Last, ultimately, by trusting fully in what he has done for me. Have you run to the lion who is the lamb? Of course you have. Can I encourage you to stay there at the foot of the cross? To never outgrow the cross. To never become proud. To not want to be first, but to be happy to stay last. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> so easy for us to point fingers. And hard words must be spoken, even to the first of the land. Help us to have courage to do that. But Lord, as we preach to them, help us to point them to the one who truly is first and who became last so that we might escape the judgment that falls upon the first. And help us to hear this word as a word of warning and rebuke. And may this word keep us at the foot of the cross, we pray. For your name's sake. Amen.